Hi, and welcome to the Neurological Foundation's Discovery Sessions. The Neurological Foundation has been funding research into neurological conditions and diseases for nearly 50 years. We have funded some amazing scientists and clinicians throughout their career, including today's speaker, who have gone on to conduct groundbreaking work and discover fascinating things about the human brain. We hope that these digital discovery sessions will help all our followers, supporters, and fellow science enthusiasts learn new things about one of the most complex organs humans have, their brain. We wanted to start out with a couple housekeeping items before we introduce today's speaker. Firstly, if the sound or video isn't working properly, try refreshing the page. If it's still not working, please send a message in the chat box located in the bottom right-hand corner of the video page, and one of our team members will respond. Secondly, the chat box. As mentioned before, it is located in the bottom right-hand corner of the page. If you have any questions for our presenter, this is where you will ask them to be answered at the end of the presentation. Because we have a limited time frame with each speaker, we may not be able to get to all of the questions asked. Additionally, please keep all of your questions to the topic being presented. Our speaker will not be able to answer any personal medical questions you may have. And lastly, if you are in the full screen mode viewing the video, the chat box function will disappear. You will need to exit the full screen mode to use the chat box function. Today's speaker is Dr. Rochelle Sumner, researcher at the University of Auckland in the Center for Brain Research. Rochelle has received funding for a small grant project from the Neurological Foundation to investigate the different types of epilepsy that occur during female menstrual cycles and how hormones and oral contraceptives play a role. Rochelle will be discussing what exactly happens in the brain when these specific epileptic seizures happen and how her research will open up a broader understanding about hormones, oral contraceptives, and epilepsy. We're grateful to Rochelle for taking time today to introduce us to her innovative research on catamenial epilepsy and how her research will further our understanding of menstrual cycles, hormones, and the female brain. Hi. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm really excited. Um, this is a research journey that I'm very much just uh, at the beginning of. Um, so welcome, and thank you for being here again. Uh, so just to get straight into it and to begin, I wanted to uh, introduce everybody to the context of epilepsy in New Zealand. So around 50,000 New Zealanders are affected by uh, epilepsy. It's not an uncommon neurological disorder at all. And around six uh, people are diagnosed every day and the Epilepsy New Zealand uh, Foundation compared that to breast cancer rates where around eight people are diagnosed every day. So again, we get this idea that uh, this is not an uncommon neurological uh, disorder. And when we take that into account and the fact that around 30% based on international statistics uh, will be treatment resistant. So this means that despite trying at least two of best available medications um, and often more, uh, they won't have adequate control of their seizures. Now uh, in New Zealand, around 46% of adults living with epilepsy uh, are either unemployed or are unable to work full time. Um, and this is said to be because many experience discrimination and difficulties pursuing job opportunities, either due to a risk or also perceived risk and discrimination about um, seizures in the workplace. Uh, furthermore, reduced independence and social isolation are common, commonly reported and common causes of this. So for example, the inability to drive uh, within certain time periods of having uh, the last seizure uh, and perhaps dis uh, difficulties living alone. And by bringing up these statistics, I wanted to uh, draw attention to the fact that seizures are not just a health risk for people with epilepsy. I think uh, most people find it really easy uh, to understand that, that seizures are risky, they can be life-threatening, um, they often aren't, but uh, they are also a major barrier to independence and social well-being, and therefore improving treatment options that reduce seizures is a neurological research priority. On the topic of introducing people to concepts, I'm about to join together. Um, for the first time, perhaps a lot of people have heard them joined together as I introduce the human menstrual cycle as well. So the average menstrual cycle is 28 days long. It's perfectly normal to have one that is considerably longer or shorter than that, but on average, it's about 28 days. And it's split into parts uh, which whose onset are characterized by milestones of hormonal changes. So the follicular phase, day one, is day one of your menstrual cycle, the onset of menses. The follicular phase runs for about half of the cycle, and the onset of ovulation signals the onset of the second luteal phase. And this is characterized by um, a fairly steep rise in estrogen, um, a gradual decrease, 
and then meets progesterone at the end for the mid luteal peak for about five days uh, for a sustained exposure. And then you get this fairly rapid withdrawal towards the end of the luteal phase. And then we cycle again and the onset of menstruation. Now that fairly rapid withdrawal following uh, five days of exposure is quite important for most disorders that um, occur related to the menstrual cycle. Um, so most people will be familiar with premenstrual sy syndrome or PMS symptoms. Uh, women will commonly report, um, <coughs> sorry, emotional, uh, maybe irritability, uh, increased carefulness, uh, that sort of thing, or bloating. Then the severe end of the spectrum of that is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, a disorder that by all accounts and purposes is equivalent to um, a full uh, major depressive episode for some reason, I forgot that word, and is only essentially different from a major depressive episode based on the fact that it's time locked to the menstrual cycle and what probably even less people have heard of is uh, catamenial epilepsy seizures that will get uh, worse at specific points in the menstrual cycle and more on that shortly. So where are progesterone and estrogen made? Uh, people familiar with the menstrual cycle um, and its physiology will probably know that it's produced uh, primarily in the reproductive organs, the corpus luteum to be exact. Um, and we know that it passes into the brain and this is how it causes uh, and affects brain function. So for example, through uh, mood, but what a lot of people don't know is that it's so important. So progesterone and estrogen are so important to healthy brain function that actually they get produced in the brain itself. So what does the menstrual cycle have to do with epilepsy? I touched on this very briefly. Now around 40% of women with epilepsy uh, will be affected by catamenial seizures. Catamenial epilepsy or seizure exacerbation is a doubling of average seizures at specific points of the menstrual cycle. Um, when in other weeks, uh, a woman would expect to experience um, less than twice as many. Now, around 70% of those affected will have C1 type. There are three different types. C1 type is the one that I just talked about related to uh, the days just before the menstrual cycle, thought to be related to a withdrawal from those hormones, uh, and the three days afterwards as well. Now, the other type is C2 type, and this uh, can occur with C1 or on its own. And this occurs during ovulation, and it's thought to be related to the big difference in estradiol and progesterone. Now, the third type is C3 type, and this is known as an inadequate luteal phase. So uh, you don't have ovulation, you get a moderate increase in estrogen um, and almost no increase in progesterone. And one of the things that's important to note at this point is that the only type that you would be able to diagnose based on a blood test um, combined with an increase in seizures is actually the C3 type. So for people affected by C1 and C2 types, by all accounts and purposes, the levels of hormones that they experience changing over the menstrual cycle are entirely within healthy range. The other challenge with catamenial epilepsy, uh, particularly C1 type, is that it's frequently drug resistant. So we don't have any uh, accepted treatments. There are certainly things that might be worth trying. Um, but for most women, it is uh, there will be challenges with treating these seizures, uh, and they may be classified as treatment resistant. So what is occurring in the brain? So we know that progesterone and estrogen are being produced in the brain. What on earth are they doing that could cause changes in the frequency with which women experience seizures? So progesterone, most people have heard of it. Um, it turns into allopregnolone. Most people haven't heard of allopregnolone. In fact. Most scientists I speak to um, not only have never heard of allopregnolone, but actually experienced pretty decent difficulties uh, saying it. I've got awfully used to it. Now, allopregnolone is essentially an anti-seizure hormone that we all have in our brain. Now, it works in the brain like lorazepam and midazolam. So it works on the GABA system. So for people that are familiar with anti-seizure medications, uh, you'll probably be familiar with the seizure abortive medications, lorazepam and midazolam. Actually, people who have experienced anxiety will probably have heard of lorazepam and midazolam too. And this is because seizures are caused if we reply, uh, apply a pretty blunt definition, too much excitation in the brain. And GABA increases inhibition. So if excitation is the push towards seizures, then GABA is the thing that's going to pull it back. And we have uh, a GABA system 
throughout the entire brain. And that's because we have these little things called receptors that receive chemicals like lorazepam and like allopregnanolone. Um, and by doing it, they uh, become more active, wide open, and you get increases in inhibition. So again, we know now that uh, we've got an anti-seizure drug, all of us essentially circulating through our brain. And we know that you might not have noticed at the bottom of the little green um, dotted line, we know that allopregnanolone is now tracking in the concentration increases and decreases alongside progesterone. So the next question becomes, why aren't we all affected? So why don't we all experience increases in seizures? Uh, and perhaps more, more pertinent, why don't all people with epilepsy? So we might be willing to accept that uh, the average person is not susceptible to seizures and therefore they don't, but why do not women with epilepsy who are susceptible to seizures? And this is where we think that something uh, more than just blood samples, something is going uh, wrong in the GABA system in the brain. So if we think that fluctuations in hormones at least must be partially responsible, why don't we just flatten the piece with hormone uh, medications? And that's uh, relatively easy to do. Um, but what's interesting is that it doesn't work. So the major theories back there that um, the difference between estrogen and progesterone or the uh, withdrawal from sustained peaks and uh, with, uh, removing all of those aren't enough to treat catamenal epilepsy most of the time. And this is interesting. And I think this is something that's worth studying and I hope I'll convince you um, by the end of my talk. So the best example uh, for this, the easiest way to produce an example of what's going on is with a combined oral contraceptive pill. The most common type of combined oral contraceptive pill contains a synthetic estrogen uh, and a synthetic progestogen. So the synthetic estrogens uh, act in the brain very much exactly the same as uh, estradiol uh, and estrogen that is produced in your brain. Same thing, the progestogen, where progesterone is one, uh, will act very much the same. However, the synthetic progesterones don't turn into allopregnanolone. And also they inhibit the natural menstrual cycle. So they keep all of your hormones low. They stop it from doing those fluctuations. And the average pill is a 28 day regime. So you get three weeks of hormone pills, 21 days, and then seven days of hormone free interval. Uh, and you get a bleed during that time that mimics menstruation. And it's important to note that it's not the shift onto the hormone-free interval that is the reason why this doesn't treat catamenal epilepsy. But it does effectively suppress the hormone fluctuations. And this is shown uh, in these graphs here. So if you look in green, these are women not on the contraceptive pill. Um, day seven and day 21, you get that increase in allopregnanolone. Day seven, 21, increase in progesterone and estradiol. For three months um, on the oral contraceptive pill, uh, you get the grass in red, where if you measure somebody's blood from their arm, you will see that there is now no longer an increase in allopregnanolone, progesterone, or estradiol. We've suppressed the menstrual cycle, therefore we've suppressed the possibility for withdrawals um, should treat menstrual cycle related disorders. And this is where we get to this interesting idea called preserved cyclicity, um, preserved cycling in the brain. So, what essentially it refers to is premenstrual symptoms that still occur despite the fact that the menstrual cycle has been largely suppressed. So in that red box, you'll see that that encompasses 14 days after a regular dose of hormones. Um, and despite the fact that the blood samples in day 21 will not be showing an increase in hormones, you see our physical symptoms of PMS. So bloating, swelling, um, breast tenderness. And this gives us an idea that there's some kind of preserved cycling that's happening in the brain, even though we have effective suppression of, of um, population, effective suppression uh, so that they're effective contraceptives. So this doesn't mean that the contraceptive isn't working in some women, but that there's something going on in the brain uh, because progesterone and estrogen are important for health function. Um, that is meaning that we need to look elsewhere for treatments, for example. So if I can't take blood samples uh, to tell me everything that I need to know, how do you study uh, what's going on in the brain over the menstrual cycle when most of the time you don't have access to the brain itself? And I use a technique called EEG and that's largely where my background is. 
So uh, this is a real picture of the EEG that we use. Um, and I usually do say here that uh, most of the time when people think about EEG and epilepsy, they're thinking about the EEG signature of uh, seizures. And I'd like to mention that my point here is not to extract information from seizures, but actually just the brain functioning as it ordinarily would. So there's a cloth cap with 64 electrodes continuously recording electrical activity. And you get uh, a screen that shows lines uh, like you'll see there on the right. And you might already start to see that there are some patterns in those lines that emerge. You might see that some of those are slightly more sharp and jaggedy. And towards the bottom, there's some bigger and, and smoother waves. And we noticed that too. So one of the things that we do um, is to look at the different shapes in the EEG signal and extract the speed at which um, the electrical signal goes up and down. And it turns out that these map on to the way that populations of neurons in the brain, so large populations, are talking to each other between lots of regions and within regions too. And that this can tell us quite a lot about how that neuron talk is happening and what's causing it. And it turns out that if you show somebody, um, and this is what a lot of my research does, is, is how can I manipulate the brain then? How can I manipulate function and what can that tell us? Um, is that if you show somebody a black and white spirally circle, their visual cortex lights up on fire and it lights up on fire in a specific frequency range. The highest one at the top are the gamma frequency range. And that over the menstrual cycle, that quick cycling uh, gets even faster in the mid luteal phase. And it turns out that the visual system based on animal research is really well defined in terms of how the GABA is mediating that process. So there's a bunch of studies that have shown that if I change GABA, then I'm gonna modulate the speed and the amplitude, so uh, the height of gamma oscillations in the visual cortex, and that if I throw other types of drugs, um, that it'll change in uh, predictable other ways. And we also know that visual gamma changes in photosensitive epilepsy, but not in other types. So um, the study on the far left there, I used visual gamma safely in photosensitive epilepsy, compared it to a group of people uh, with a, a diverse range of other types of epilepsy and photosensitive only was the one that increased visual gamma responses. And there's a neat little contrast there. If you induce gamma, which you can with movements, um, you also get changes in uh, the beta range. So there's a slightly slower range, but not in the title there it is gamma in the motor system. So uh, you can look at changes in gamma function in different regions, but what this also means that photosensitive epilepsy is quite rare. If I wanted to study catamenal epilepsy, I could just exclude people with photosensitive epilepsy, target the visual system, um, and this could be a really, really useful tool. And also just to touch on is that you might think at this point, I don't know if I haven't lost you by now, uh, that, okay, so I might be able to show that gamma frequency changes over the menstrual cycle that I might also be able to show that gamma frequency changes in a different way in catamenial epilepsy. And that would be really interesting. And I would expect that that would tell us something about the GABA system, but it doesn't really get at why uh, some women are affected and others aren't. And this is where something I don't have a lot of time to talk about, but you can actually build models of how the visual system is built and how it builds together to create oscillations and then you get this list of information and you'll see GABA A there in red. Um, and I would expect that this will help us to pinpoint exactly where in the circuit that all together creates oscillations uh, will give us um, where to look in the system and a potential target treatment. So to summarize, because I realize um, that this has all happened awfully quickly now. Allopregnanolone is essentially an anti-seizure hormone that we all have in our brain. And that we know that GABA inhibition changes over the brain, over the menstrual cycle, and that we can measure that change with EEG doing really simple things um, with spirally circles and recording it using 64 electrodes. 
But what we're also learning is that withdrawal from hormones might not give us all of the information that we need to explain ketamine and epilepsy. We know that if we flatten the hormone peaks, uh, that we don't have an effective treatment most of the time. And this is where what we need to work on is what underlies preserved cyclicity in the brain. Because if we take away the major surges using oral contraceptive, and we know that we can, I'm interested in what is left uh, that changes over each month in women. Because I think that it's possible that there's changes occurring in the brain that are occurring because of the hormone changes, but that if those if taking those away don't treat ketamine or epilepsy, then they might just be a distraction. And that if I use oral contraceptive, for example, as a tool, then I could see in my data that measured women without the oral contraceptive, and in women who did, uh, what's left could be the target for treatment, because it's the thing that's still changing. It's the thing that underlies preserved cyclicity in the brain as well. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. Um, so we're running at the moment women who don't have epilepsy, um, just to see, because there's a lot of work to make up, there's a lot of things that we don't know, just to see what is left um, and to see what that mechanism is. And where I want to go after this, because I have to build quite a big picture, is what does cataminal epilepsy look like in the brain using gamma oscillations and EEG? And this is where I'm hoping to take my research next. So I admit that I delivered this a fair bit faster than I did in my uh, practice. And most people have been to a talk, uh, perhaps where they've seen me speak before, will know that I, I frequently do this. So I hope I didn't speak too fast and I'm really looking forward to questions. But before um, I finish up, I really wanted to acknowledge the people that are really important to this research. So first of all, um, Associate Professor Suresh Mutakumaraswamy, who is an absolute EEG expert um, and a pharmaco EEG expert. Um, Professor Stephen Dakin, uh, I didn't present some work here, but if you got interested by the fact that you can use black and white spirally circles to work on the GABA system in the brain, um, Stephen Dakin is an expert in visual psychophysics and we're looking at how else we can manipulate uh, the visual system uh, to give us more information about chemical function in the brain. Alak Gal Shakuri, she's my honor student um, and she's helping me collect data and also uh, Dr. Cynthia Sharp and Dr. Peter Bergen, who are helping me to build that study, uh, researching C1 epilepsy in the brain. And lastly, uh, the Neurological Foundation, thank you for supporting me to do this research to understand preserved cyclicity so I can work out uh, whether this could be a really useful tool to un understand catamenal epilepsy. So thank you. Okay, so the first question I've got there is, is there a link between hysterectomy and epilepsy? Uh, so my understanding is that a hysterectomy can be a fairly extreme option uh, that will be used to treat ketamine and epilepsy. Um, I'm not sure exactly on its efficacy rates. That would be a question for a neurologist, um, but yes. Yeah, so the Marina IUD, is it separate to oral contraceptive? Absolutely. It produces hormones as well. Um, something I didn't talk a lot about is um, the way the different synthetic progestogens um, differently affect how we produce hormones. The thing that's uh, important about the IUD is that obviously because it is placed in the uterus, um, it actually doesn't, uh, it, it's supposed to act locally it doesn't inhibit ovulation. It doesn't um, suppress cycling at all. So if you took blood samples most of the time, you wouldn't notice a big difference. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are there connections to menopause? I'm not sure what happens to epilepsy after menopause. Obviously, the cycling of catamenial epilepsy will change um, with the menstrual cycle. Um, and you would expect catamenial epilepsy to be alleviated, but I know that the balance of hormones changes over menopause. Um, again, so you 
I'm not familiar with any specific um, disorder that has been linked to epilepsy seizures over menopause. For example, I'm not familiar with the title, um, but I wouldn't say that the seizures might absolutely get better. They would be expected to, um, and from a catamenal epilepsy perspective, but you never know if other things will change. Catamenal epilepsy should resolve. Um, is there a cyclicity in terms of epilepsy in the male brain too? Not that I know of. Not that, not that I know of. Um, and that's largely because it's progesterone um, and that doesn't tend to cycle. Uh, so allopregnanolone, it doesn't tend to cycle in males. But I guess what I don't want to rule out is other types, um, other... I guess, changes that can occur, but not that I know of, and certainly not in the same way and not related to the same hormones. Over the day, it's fairly stable. When I do my research, I do tend to run, oh, sorry, I didn't read the question out. Do we know the time of day that progesterone turns into allopregnanolone? Is it typically at night or first time in the morning? Um, it's fairly stable. Uh, so what you will see is there is a slight delay in days. Um, so progesterone starts to rise and it takes a couple of days for the detectable change in allopregnanolone to rise as well. So there's never so slight delay. Over the day, the ratio um, from what we know is quite stable. Uh, but I always run all women in the afternoon anyway because all sorts of things change over the day uh, that do affect the EEG signal. So we control for that anyway, because the one thing that I would caution is that because we know that these things are being caused in the brain, we can't measure. We know that allopregnanolone is in the blood, but we can't actually measure how its function is changing in the brain. So we exercise caution, but throughout the day in terms of blood samples, I don't believe so. Okay, so what could be the practical application of this information to support workers or family uh, who like, look after women with this type of epilepsy? One of the things I guess with the science is that it does sit reasonably far back um, for now in terms of how it changes people who are affected by epilepsy now. And that's because I'm still trying to work out what exactly is going on in the brain, I've been surprised at how much we don't know. Uh, what I would hope that maybe the information that I provided is that there's more information, more in awareness um, and more discussions that we can have about the fact that there are powerful neurosteroids changing the brain, that they are changing seizures and that we do not have enough treatment options um, and that it isn't enough to take away those hormone sur uh, surges, so we need to think harder about it. Uh, so those sorts of conversations, if they're useful, um, then I hope that they make a positive impact, but I do acknowledge that the trajectory toward um, finding new treatments, it's a few years of research away. Um, yeah. So where do I hope to go next with this research? And when might it lead to solutions to those impacted each month? So one thing that I'm quite excited about. Um, so the first thing I really have to do, and I have quite a lot of work to do, is to work out what catamenal epilepsy even looks like in the brain. Because almost everything that we know so far is based on rodent research. And that's because historically, the techniques, um, the gamma oscillations are quite difficult to measure in the brain. Uh, and it's only quite recently that it's become really sensitive. And so before now, we've had to do a lot of research with rodents. Um, and the problem with that is that their menstrual cycles are only four days long. So if you wanna create things like that four day exposure, you have to produce it in the brain. But then also you cause the disorder by making assumptions on what you think causes it. Uh, and this is where I get to this idea with preserved cyclicity is that we know there's something more going on. Um, 
that could be the function of the GABA system. And I think that in order to understand catamenial epilepsy, we have to research it in the brain of women who are affected. The very first thing I have to do is start quite far back and I get the feeling that you've got that impression already and, and work out what catamenial epilepsy even looks like in the brain to begin with. But the thing that's really exciting is that allopregnanolone for the very first time um, was actually um, approved by the FDA as a treatment for postpartum depression. So there is now a synthetic allopregnanolone that's been released as a medicine. So if allopregnanolone is at the center of this, then it could be that we meet at a crossroads in a few years time um, where there are the treatments available and now I have the measures to determine why they're working and where we should look. Um, and then it should lead to an impact. And I'm really hoping that it helps to uh, direct the search for treatment, but I've got a, a lot of work to do to work out what, what catamenal epilepsy looks like in the brain. Um, so I hope that that was interesting um, and that you learned something. Um, and I'm always interested in hearing from people um, who are interested in what I'm doing, uh, but otherwise, I've been told that was the last question, uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>